This lesson is on the condition known as epididymitis. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about what this condition is. We're also going to talk about what causes it, some of the risk factors for getting it. And then we're also going to talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So what is epididymitis? If we were to actually look at the word epididymitis, the prefix epididym refers to the epididymis and itis refers to inflammation. So it is a urologic condition involving inflammation of the epididymis. So what is the epididymis? The epididymis is actually a tubular structure located on the posterior testis or on the posterior portion of the testicle. This structure is actually involved in storage and maturation of sperm. So here's the epididymis in this area here. And it is also used as a conduit for transport of sperm to the vas deferens. Now, this condition is due to infectious and non-infectious causes. We're going to talk about those causes in the next slide. And it is a relatively common condition. It affects 1 in 1,000 males per year. And it is actually the fifth most common urologic condition. And the majority of cases of this condition occurs in the 20 to 59 year age group. So what causes epididymitis? There are actually several categories of causes of this condition. One of them is retrograde urine flow. This is going to be a very important cause of this condition. This is where there is some obstruction that blocks or obstructs the urine flow from the bladder through the urethra. So if there's some kind of obstruction there, there can be some retrograde flow of urine, and this can eventually lead to inflammation of the epididymis. Another category of causes is injury or irritation. So you can imagine that if there is some injury to the testis, if it's from some excessive physical activity or some injury to that location, this can also lead to inflammation of that structure. There are certain infections that can also lead to epididymitis as well. This is going to be more common and actually the most common cause under the age of 35. So some of the causes can include enteric bacteria like E. coli. This can lead to a urinary tract infection, which is going to be rare in males, but it can happen and this can lead to epididymitis. But there can also be some sexually transmitted diseases that can also lead to this condition. These are going to be more common in that age group we talked about before. These are going to include chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea. We can also see Tryponema pallidum, which is the cause of syphilis, and then we can also see Gardnerella vaginalis. These bacteria can actually lead to another condition known as acute epididymoorchitis, and this is a condition where the infection inflammation actually spreads from the epididymis into the testis as well, so this can lead to other symptoms. And another category of causes of this condition is medications, and one of those medications is amiodarone. So amiodarone can lead to amiodarone-induced epididymitis. So now that we know the causes, this can help us better understand the risk factors. So some of the risk factors for getting this condition include retrograde urine flow. That is one of the causes of this condition. And this essentially leads into some more specific risk factors, which include bladder outlet obstruction. So this can be due to benign prostatic hyperplasia. So something that can happen later on in life, there can be a benign growth of the prostate. This can lead to a bladder outlet obstruction and retrograde urine flow. And then this can also be something from prostate cancer as well. Anatomical abnormalities can also lead to this condition. This is going to be more common in children. So if there is some anatomical abnormality that is leading to retrograde urine flow, this can also lead to this condition. And interestingly, the Valsalva maneuver, especially if it's experienced excessively, this can lead to differential pressures in the urologic system, which can lead to retrograde urine flow as well. And then strenuous exercise can also be a cause under this category of risk factors. Unprotected sexual activity is another risk factor. And under this risk factor is young age. So the younger the individual more often there's going to be more unprotected sexual activity and this is going to relate to the bacterial causes we talked about before including chlamydia and Neisseria gonorrhea. And then trauma can also be another risk factor. There's trauma to the area. This can cause inflammation of the epididymis. Being an athlete is also another risk factor. So particularly weightlifters and runners. So running particularly can cause some irritation in that area. So that again is one of the causes we talked about before. And overall, generally doing some repetitive activities that is causing irritation to the scrotum and particularly the area of the epididymis. This can lead to irritation and inflammation of the epididymis. So again, these are some of the risk factors that can cause this condition. What are some of the signs and symptoms of this condition? It's important to note that the symptoms of this condition often develop over several days. This is going to be in contrast to testicular torsion, which is very important to highlight here because these are going to be often 
oftentimes compared. Epididymitis is going to occur over the course of several days. So some of the signs and symptoms that can occur with epididymitis include LUTs or lower urinary tract symptoms, L-U-T-S. So these are urinary urgency, feeling like you need to urgently use the washroom, increased urinary frequency, feeling like you need to use the washroom often and frequently, even though there may be very low or small levels of urine volume. And then dysuria, which is a burning sensation when urinating, these can occur with epididymitis. Scrotal pain can also occur. This is going to be a hallmark characteristic finding of this condition. You can imagine that if the epididymis, which is located again on the posterior aspect of the testis or in the posterior portion of the scrotum, if this is inflamed, it's going to cause scrotal pain. So this is going to be a very, very key finding here. Oftentimes this pain is going to be slowly occurring. So it's going to have a slow onset and there may be some swelling as well, but there may not be. It's oftentimes going to be on one side. It's going to be unilateral. And then what's key here is that when you touch the epididymis, it's tender to palpation. Very key finding in the physical examination of this condition. A fever may occur. So you can imagine that if there's part of your body that is inflamed, a fever can occur as well. It's going to more often occur in children who are affected with this condition. So in children, again, we talked about anatomical abnormalities that lead to epididymitis in children. That's going to be most commonly the cause of epididymitis in children. Three quarters of children with this condition are going to experience a fever, whereas in adults, it's going to be less common. One quarter of adults are estimated to be affected by a fever with this condition. So a fever can occur, but it may not occur with this condition. Some other signs and symptoms of this condition include urethral discharge. So having a discharge from the urethra can occur. It may occur prior to other symptoms in some cases. Oftentimes, it's going to occur in cases where the underlying cause is one of those bacteria we talked about before, chlamydia, trachomatis, or Neisseria gonorrhea. And then there are some other findings that can occur in some patients, but not always. Some of these include blood in the semen, inguinal lymphadenopathy, so the lymph nodes in the groin may become swollen and tender to touch. And then the scrotum itself, although we talked about it perhaps being coming swollen, it can also become warm and reddened as well in some cases. How is this condition diagnosed and treated by clinicians? So in order to diagnose this condition, oftentimes a urinalysis is going to be performed. And what will be found is oftentimes pyuria, which is pus or white blood cells in the urine, and bacteriuria, which is bacteria in the urine. Not always because some other causes of this condition don't necessarily have to be bacteria, but if it is one of those infectious causes we talked about before, we can or we may see those bacteria in the urine. Urine culture and sensitivities are going to be important, especially if it is a bacterial cause. A CBC can also be performed or a complete blood count, and that will show leukocytosis or an increased white blood cell count. And then a nucleic acid amplification test can also be performed if it is suspected that it is chlamydia trachomatis or Neisseria gonorrhea. Some other important methods to diagnose this include imaging with ultrasonography, voiding cystourethrogram or VCUG can also be performed, and then retrograde urethrography can also be used. Treatment of this condition oftentimes is going to be addressing those risk factors we talked about before. So if it's due to physical activity, irritation, injury, it's important to reduce those physical activities. Remember, one of those risk factors was repetitive activities. So reducing or avoiding that particular physical activity can help with the resolution of this condition. Scrotal support can also be utilized. Pain relief for the pain from this condition can also be important. So using NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, ice packs can be used, and using a sitz bath can also be helpful. Helpful. And then with regards to some of the infective causes, antibiotics are important. So some of these are going to include ceftriaxone and doxycycline. These are going to be used to treat those sexually transmitted diseases we talked about before, like chlamydia and Neisseria gonorrhea. So it's important to treat with both ceftriaxone and doxycycline, and then also important to treat the patient's partner. And then if it is another type of bacteria, like an enteric bacteria that is causing this, a fluoroquinolone can also be very important, like levofloxacin. So the fluoroquinolone can be used in this case because these have better penetration of the testis and the scrotal tissue. So fluoroquinolone can be important for treating this condition. If it is chronic epididymitis, so chronic epididymitis is going to be defined by having discomfort or pain of the epididymis or scrotum or testis for at least three months. That is going to be chronic epididymitis. In that case, four to six weeks of antibiotics are going to be important. And if it is refractory epididymitis, if many things have been tried, but nothing is working, it's been going on for a very, very long period of time, this would be considered a refractory epididymitis. One way of treating that 
would be a surgical removal of the epididymis, which would be an epididymectomy. So that can be a potential method of treating refractory epididymitis. If you want more information on prostatitis or an inflammation of the prostate gland, please check out my full lesson on that topic. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.